so I'm Alice Rose. I'm the Research and Documentation Assistant at Holland East Riding Museum. Um, and today I'm here with Ruth Thompson from Sylvan Skills. Um, you might have seen her video on our channel about creating Wattle and Daub. So if you haven't already watched it, make sure you check it out now um, and then come back because I'm going to ask Ruth a few questions that people have submitted all about kind of that video and the process of making Wattle and Daub. So, hello Ruth, um, and we'll get into it. So the first question um, we had was that you mentioned in the first the, that the first thin hazel rods were one year old. Um, how old were the uprights that you were using in that wattle and door? Right, well actually I may have made a mistake in that all the hazel rods are actually the same age but because they're a cut off an existing hazel bush, we call it a stool, you get thinner rods and thicker rods so I suspect they were all about four or five years old but the stouter rods are used as the <clears throat> as the uprights and then the thinner rods are used as the weavers. So is that because the uprights then it's kind of like they need to be a bit sturdier because everything hangs off that? Is That's that right yes they've got to withstand being you know woven against and and hold the structure together whereas the weavers they have to be thin enough that you can return them at the ends and, and weave them in and out. Mm -hmm. cool. So the next question we've got for you is does the timber need to be weathered before it's used or is it all coppiced in the same year and is green wood better? <clears throat> well um, I mean obviously when you coppice you you continually rejuvenate the material so it doesn't become old and woody and um, generally speaking it's better to cut it in the winter that's more traditional and I think it, it's still possible to use it in the spring and the summer um, but it'll have a lot more sap in it and um, this means that well I don't know if you ever heard you know somebody breaks their arm sometimes they call it a green stick fracture where it's like a green stick just does fracture very easily compared to a winter cut one so if I was cutting it in the spring I would actually let it dry out probably for a couple of weeks depending on how what the weather's like Whereas in the winter, you could use it almost straight away. Um, also, it's not so good in a way to use it in the summer because of the sap. It's got sugars in and it means the bark is quite enriched. And um, so little bugs will want to go and eat it. So it's less likely to look nice for as long, you know, because it's, it's going to, it gets attacked basically by things. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I mean, if you've got a large coppice woodland, it's not going to affect it too much if you do cut some of it in the summer as well. Yeah. So just to clarify for people who don't know, um, and correct mm. me if I'm wrong, Ruth, coppice mm. woodland, so when you coppice something, that's when you're kind of really hard pruning or really chopping a tree back, and it's that yes. process of letting the tree kind of grow its branches out again. And it's used quite commonly, isn't it? They mainly use coppice wood for things like wattle and daub because it means that you're kind of sustaining that plant's life and rejuvenating it to get the new wood coming out. Yes, yes. I think if a hazel isn't coppiced, it might live for about 60 years and then it basically it, it can't really cope. Um, and I think um, they do say that large mammals, like in the past we had um, hairy elephants called mastodons, you know, they used to wander around the woods and sort of crush the stools or something and, and it was like it was it, it was an evolutionary thing um but it's actually been great and then of course humans took over about in the I don't know, the bronze age and um i mean we've been coppicing trees for a long time uh, uh, hazel is very useful but you can have longer rotations for things like oak and sweet chestnut and ash you get bigger poles but <clears throat> but they can be quite useful for sturdier constructions and um, people obviously knew a lot about this in the past i think they've even coppiced oak but you would leave it for a very long time but you'd get some lovely timbers off it and um, so sometimes you see incredibly old areas of coppice you know hundreds or thousands of years old uh, which normally a tree would only last 60 years so it's it's um, it's quite an amazing process really. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to think they can kind of really outlive kind mm. of our own generation and that's how it would have been in the past as well. Yes, yes, that's, that's a good point. 
I'll um, it's because I'm an archaeologist. It always goes back to that. Oh yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Well, they find some amazing sites, don't they? Um, under sort of boggy ground of of um, wooden houses and so on, going back thousands of years. Yeah. Mm. So I'll, I'll move on to our next question. Yes. So it's, um, if the wood is green when it's used, would it warp as it dried out or would the porous daub keep it damp enough to stop that warp happening? I, I think it probably will eventually dry out and it will um, tends to shrink a bit. But um, you see, I think that I think it doesn't matter too much because the daub is this sort of composite and it has fibres in it. So although the mixture moves, will move uh, with temperature and changes in humidity, I think it can withstand that. So yes, it, I'm sure the, the the wattle material won't be exactly the same when it's first made as it will a few weeks later. But it's it seems, I suppose, because of its this method has evolved that. Um, the, the the material seems to be able to cope with that and I suppose because the the way the hazel you know you do this pairing and it binds on really tightly so it's in effect it doesn't matter too much if some of it goes a little bit looser mm. oh um, I, I, sorry if that's a bit vague um it's uh it's difficult because once it's got the door yes. you can't yeah see you it. can't see it <laughs> <laughs> So if the wooden zales were hammered into the soil, would they rot yes. at the base after a while? Uh, yes, I think they would. I mean, I think generally speaking, we make these woven panels and they're sort of inset into the frame of a building. And Or if you were making fence panels, they're probably just fastened onto some, say, oak posts. And oak is much more woody, especially heartwood. So that would last for a lot longer. So you often see cleft oak using for, for, for posts um, um, people sometimes use alder because that can withstand wet ground actually that you know in old round houses in boggy land they've often found that the uprights were made of alder and then the Watland door was hazel yeah and so, from um, archaeological experience you know when we look yeah. at things like medieval buildings when they build timber oh. frame buildings they tend yeah. to put like um, brick underneath the kind of main supporting posts. Oh, so that's exactly, right. So it means the wood isn't, you know, obviously it's surrounded maybe by soil, but there's actually yes. a platform is something oh. quite stable. So oh, that's interesting. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But it right. also explains why um, when we're looking at archaeological records as well, you can see like, again, that kind of rejuvenation of buildings and it's why a lot of things like medieval uh -huh houses for poorer people make yes. they last you know the lifetime of a group of people and then they you know not yeah. build something else and that's why mm. the material like wattle and door was made from natural materials that actually yes. are almost byproducts from other industries can kind yes. of used and it it makes sense doesn't it Yes, it's it's a locally locally grown and often you use yeah waste and stuff. It's it's very efficient. Yeah. <laughs> so if you were building a house, would it be made of panels for each side, or would the ro woven rods go round the corners? Um, I think it, if it was an actual house, I think unless it was a round house, you know, I, I suspect you'd want actual corner posts, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> sort of put the panels up to the edge of the post sometimes to be like a beading and the and you would actually just put the hazel on either side of the beading or you could actually have a panel that you make an inset but I I wouldn't have thought I, 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 I haven't heard you see really the the structure of the house is the frame and um, if, if, if the hazel was to go round the corners then the the post wouldn't be very big so it would be okay for something like a roundhouse possibly or some sort of temporary small like a thing for housing geese or something you know but um i i'm not i'm not too sure about having the, the whole house enclosed in in hazel in that way yeah and again you know from 
medi medieval buildings and things like that we do know it was yes. very much timber frame buildings and then yes. bottle was one of the possible infills they would have used they used other things as well yes yes I'm thinking of your traditional house that kind of in the same kind of shapes we have today yeah very much framed mm. isn't it? And the pattern. yes 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 mm. so the next mm. question we get a little bit more technical i think <laughs> Yes. Is it better to cleave the hazel rods along the pit? Mm -hmm. And if so, is it easy to keep the bill hook cutting along the pit? Yes, well, so the pit is right in the core. And um, generally, you do try and get the split to run along the centre of the rod through the pit. Um, and it's not that easy. But once you've learnt the skill, it's, it's like anything you you know, you don't find it too difficult, but it did take me about two or three days of just wasting bits of hazel, trying to learn how to cleave. It's rather like, say, reversing a trailer. You have to anticipate if it's starting to go the wrong way, you have to change your position so it goes the right way. Um, and it, and it, it's almost as though your muscles learn what to do. So you could see me, I had the bill hook and I had my elbow in here and I was pushing that bit with against the ground and sort of levering it. So as soon as the split starts to run off one way, you have to push it the other way, and it, and it literally kind of guides it. There is a, a sort of cheating method, which I didn't show you, but it, it involves two people. But if you have um, something like a strong metal post, like a washing line post or something, you can actually start the split at the end and um, open it up so the split's about a foot long. And then you, you kind of offer that up to the post, and then you have to have a companion who who pulls the two ends and they walk slowly backwards and, and I'm the one that's guiding the split and actually <clears throat> you can you can cleave it that's quite a good way for somebody to learn because it's so obvious what's happening and, and somebody else is gradually pulling the, the material away but whereas if you're on your own it's um it's a bit more tricky you know um <laughs> so you really um, have to be quite in tune with kind of how this mm. sounds a bit like oh but you have to be quite in tune with the words and the feel of yes. the words and what you're doing and know those kind of sounds and the, the look as yes. well, don't you? As you're kind yes, of it's, it's, very, it's very intuitive and you're constantly having to literally almost feel what's happening. I think with the hand that's holding the wood, you're almost feeling what's happening mm -hmm. as, you're, as you're splitting it, yes. <laughs> well, well, we're moving on to a very popular topic of dung next. Yes. So you mentioned dung as one of the materials for daub. Mm. If stable manure was used, what ingredients could be left out of the daub mix? Well, um, I'm not sure that I think the dung was in effect just an additional material because um, it was cheaper to just use straw that's already been used rather than clean new straw. And sometimes animals were used to sort of stamp on the material to mix it all up and some of their dung might have gone into the mixture. Um, so, because, you know, you still need your your various components. Like, I think you couldn't get away with, if you had dung, you, you wouldn't say leave out the, the clay because that binds it together. And you still need some sort of solid material like earth or sand in it. So I, I suspect that the dung was really just an additional extra. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's some fibres in the dung, as there are in straw. So that's that that component of the dung is quite helpful. <laughs> well, and you can imagine, like you say, you know, people, it's a byproduct. You're going to have to get rid of the straw from the staple anyway, or whatever yes. place where the animals are living. And it makes true. Sense, it makes sense to try and utilise that and use it as many mm. times as possible, doesn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So. What other washes could be used on the walls um, if there wasn't any lime? That's, that's yes. Got... Well, I, I have heard of people using blood, <laughs> which seems a bit odd. But I suppose, <clears throat> it, it, you know, if there was a, an abattoir or something, and also I think it gave a nice colour, a kind of pinky colour. But um, and and it, 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 I, I, I see. Obviously, I'm not an expert on this. Um, People sometimes used to think mix horse hair in with the with the outer layer as well. <clears throat> Presumably, it, it again gives a bit of a coating, and it's a fibre that kind of helps to to bind stuff together. Yes, yeah. and, and I, I think depending on where you got your materials from, 
you know, you may have slightly different colors of earth anyway, so you could get more of a yellowy color or, a, or you know, different shades. Um, you know, it's a sort yeah. of vernacular architecture depending on the locality and what's lying around, really. Yeah, I think it's, um, if I remember rightly, I think down in Suffolk it tends to be more of a pinky colour, whereas if you yes. go to the Lothians, um, oh, your yes. might be a bit more orangey. Um, oh, that's interesting. So, you mean the Lothians near Edinburgh? or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, all oh, right. Oh, I wonder how that, that's interesting. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm, it's down um, to the bedrock, I think, partly, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All tied into natural stuff and what you've got nearby. So um, yes. the next one we have is how do you get the wattle off the former when you've finished? Mm. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> if it was an actual wattle and door in situ thing, you wouldn't have to move it once you've made it. But um, basically, um, obviously, it's stuck in the ground. So you have to sort of what I do is lever the bottom of the hurdle off the former with maybe my bill hook so that the points are starting to come off the ground and then the easiest thing I find is just to tip the whole thing over and then get my wooden mallet and kind of bang the former off the hurdle rather than trying to yank the hurdle off. It's so dangerous if you try and pull the hurdle off it may compress the weave on one side or the other so it becomes bowed whereas if you just gently sort of bash the former at one end, bash it at the other and then there's a satisfying kind of clunk when it falls off and then I usually just sort of rest the panel on the edge of the former and just knock it with the wooden mallet all along just to straighten it up if it has got a bit deformed just tighten it up because obviously the only time I've touched it was when I was knocking it from the top whereas you want to tighten it up from the bottom and then I usually um, if it's just a woven panel I'd probably cut off those points that had gone into the ground so I've got a nice neat edge at the bottom yes mm -hmm. so we've got one final question today um so could you make an eco home out of this material and if so where could they find more information about how to do it mm. well i i had to think about this and um you know years ago i went to wales the center for alternative technology um they've been there for decades and they do have a lot of interesting buildings around the site some of them are quite traditional, old little tiny frame buildings. Some are very modern, but they have got earth walls, which is quite interesting. But I, I suspect um, that people wouldn't build an eco home purely out of Wattle and Daub, because these days we have so many interesting and innovative ideas of um, using, say, we can recycle materials, we can put more high tech, you know, solutions in place. But, but the thing is, earth is a good insulator. So I, I, I suspect, you know, you could have parts of the building with Watland door, but, but make the earth a bit thicker so that it's a really good insulator. Also, the fact that it's, you know, locally available, you don't have to transport it very far. So that's green, isn't it? And, and wood is carbon neutral. Um, um, I, I did have a look at some sites which were more about traditional wattle and daub and um, green building sites but I think that you'd have to do a little bit of digging um, but I think the, the sub Centre for Alternative Technology might be a good place to start. Um, it definitely has a low carbon footprint so that you know it, it, you see, if you wanted to build a, a roundhouse um, that is very low impact and kind of an eco building, but it wouldn't be very comfortable to live in. You know, I think we want to have um, nice, nice finish on the walls and um, probably underfloor heating with a um, some sort of green energy. You know, so that you'd, you'd you'd sort of adapt modern technology to old old traditional techniques. I would say, um, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've seen things where people have used stuff like big straw bales and actually had, you know, the, uh, the width of yes. a, a straw bale as part of their house. So I think it's quite yes. an interesting thing to look at, you know, some of the methods we've yes. had from the past and seeing yes. if we could incorporate them into some aspects of kind of building and life today to try mm. and move to a more sustainable. Yes, I, I've seen where, where you had these straw bales and you actually fastened together with hazel rods. 
and you can put um, a lime wash on the outside or whatever, and that helps to actually hold, it's, it's incredibly strong because there's such a huge surface area of the strobels that when you put the lime wash on or the or whatever it is, the lime mortar, it, it, it really kind of always helps to hold the building up a bit as well. And it's very well insulated, as you say. So um, it, it's fascinating, actually. And also sometimes people just use pure earth, don't they? It's called cob. So rather than bothering with the wattle, you see, if you've got your, if you've got your structure, there's, there's just, it's just, the earth is a very good insulator and it's slightly breathable as well. So rather than having a sort of, having to have extractor fans and um, very con, you know, you might have get a lot of condensation. It, the, the, the air will pass through from either direction, depending on what's happening with the environmental conditions. Yeah. I suppose it's also having an awareness that, of course, we, with using traditional building methods, often that then often yeah. comes with a lot of, um, you know, maintenance or things associated with it. Yes. That a lot of in the modern world, yes. a lot of people seem to not want to deal with. No. Like we've talked about the lime wash on the daub and things mm. like that. Thinking about you yes. probably have to do that about once a year, I'm assuming, and mm. there will be all you know, like we were talking about the fact that the yeah. buildings might only have a kind of limited lifespan as well. Mm. Whereas now we like to have buildings yes. we know we're going to last for a long that's, period of time. Yes, that's right. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, people used to patch them up regularly, didn't they, with new coating of lime or whatever every year, and it was slightly antibacterial as well so uh, but we wouldn't want to be doing that yes 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 it's, it's, it's a fascinating subject though i think it could lead on to a lot of discussion you know mm -hmm. yeah. yes. well that's i've all... enjoyed doing that yeah i've yeah, enjoyed had, doing that's, it yeah. that's all the questions we've kind of had mm. for you today i don't know if you have mm. anything else you'd like to say or we can kind of wind up there um well i, I mean I'm going to go out coppicing in a bit because <laughs> I got somebody wants to make um, some fencing around their little yard and to stop the kids from crashing into the greenhouse or something. And then another lady wants just literary poles for holding up her broad beans and her roses and things like that, you know. And, and then I've got an inquiry from a school that a lot of schools have fire pits. So they have these sort of wattle fences in effect to stop the kids um, running into the running onto the fire. They, they they go in through one entrance and then they go and sit down around the edge of the circle and it's a sort of enclosing and it keeps the wind off as well, but it is quite traditional. And so, so for some reason that seems to appeal to um, to schools, which is rather a nice thing to do. <laughs> well, it's nice to see how the kind of versatility of the material and all the things that we're mm. still using, you know, the same kind of technology mm. and using the same natural materials, mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of years mm. after people originally did. So, mm. uh, and much. also the, the actual woodland, you know, it's, it's, it has quite a lot of diversity. I mean, the woodland I copies, it's on an old industrial site on what used to be a coal field under some power lines, but it's, and it's laid out, <clears throat> you know, like in a sort of grid of, of hazel trees, but they've got red squirrels, they've got, um, well, loads of hazelnuts. <clears throat> and when we cut a coop um, in a more slightly older material, the loads of wild flowers come up, you know, so even in quite a small area, it increases the biodiversity quite a lot. Mm -hmm. It's quite a pleasant place to just have a look, have a walk through, you know, and um, so... Um, it, 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 although it's a kind of engineered landscape in a way, it's it's also I think home to a lot of native species. So that's uh, you know worth doing even on a on a really small scale. If people wanted to plant a row of hazel trees and cut a few down every year, then they'd always have stuff for the garden. But it 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 provides a good habitat as well. Well, thank you very much for answering our questions today um, and hopefully we'll hear from you again soon.